Boy, hello. <laughs> Who are you? Oh my, I'm scared. Oh, I mean, I'm the green eye princess. Oh, don't be afraid of me. I'm domesticated. Well, that's a relief. Who are you? Oh, I'm Lion. Hey, do you know where we are? I escaped the zoo with some of my friends, but it seems everyone is hiding. I wonder if I scared them. Oh no, we're just all used to sheltering in place. Hey Lion, we were looking for you. Hey Lion. You have lots of friends, Lion, but something doesn't seem right. Don't lions eat other animals? Oh, Lion became a vegetarian in the zoo after I read him Isaiah chapter 11. He realized he could prepare to meet Jesus by not eating the rest of us. And he likes the dried cat food and straw they bring him, but he likes to eat tree leaves with me too. Oh, I see. You know, you remind me of my friends at church. We are all different just like all you are different. Would you like to join our service starting right now? Yes. yes! To learn more about the Midtown Bridge, please go to their website at themidtownbridge.com. And if you are a visitor this morning, please go to tmbguest.com and tell the nice humans there how, the, how you can, they can help you. And if you miss Kid Town just now, please join us next Sunday morning at 9.30. Hello, we are the Chirwanki family and we are so glad that you are joining us this morning. Let's go ahead and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us here uh, together this morning. We ask that you would speak to us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. And now we are going to turn it over to the worship team.
Where is new? This where. 
vessel, make me your vessel, and make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Well, good morning, Midtown Bridge family. This is Pastor Milton. And again, I want to say to those who are joining us, thank you for uh, tuning in as we've been walking through the book of 1 Thessalonians in our Confident Hope series. And I just so pray that you have been encouraged by God's word. Um, I know I have been encouraged by his word, but also I've been encouraged by God's people. And so I just pray that this message, this word is a message of hope to encourage you today. Whether you listen to this on Sunday morning or maybe uh, this just kind of comes across your feed, uh, man, years from now. I just pray that you will be encouraged by this holy word and scripture um, to exhort you towards following Christ more faithfully. Um, we are in our Confident Hope series. This is our final week where this morning we're going to be in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. So I ask you to make your way there. And uh, while you're doing that, uh, I've shared this with the Midtown Bridge store, uh, family many times in the past. Um, one of my favorite shows growing up was that of uh, Batman. And uh, Batman and Robin, I'm talking about the initially black and white and then it moved to color where they had the tight spandex and you see these words come on the screen periodically. Midtown Bridge Church, you know where I'm going because you've heard this illustration before. Um, but you'd always, almost every episode, you'd have this moment where you'd see Batman and Robin just hanging out um, at the mansion. And then all of a sudden, uh, these words will come on the screen. Midtown Bridge, you already know what it is. Meanwhile. And what meanwhile meant was it meant that uh, while Batman and Robin was over here uh, minding their own business, seems like things are going pretty smoothly. Uh, meanwhile, you'd find Joker across town and he was wreaking havoc. I mean, he was tearing some stuff up. Um, and, and I think about that. That has always been an inspiration for me. For me, one, just looking back at my childhood, but also when I think about just the calling of a believer. Uh, right now, where I'm filming uh, this message from, I'm in the middle of the woods. I'm behind my house, and uh, right behind me, there's a golf course, a place of leisure where people go to clear their minds, to beat up on some golf balls, good or bad, but it's a place of leisure, of comfort. And then on the front side of me, if I also walk straight ahead, it will walk pretty much into my home, to my backyard, uh, through the back door. And that's a place of safety and security. But yet right now surrounding me, you hear the birds chirping, I'm in this wilderness, if you will. And I believe that is the calling and the challenge of every Christ follower. That we are called to live in this world in somewhat of a wilderness, as the Bible would kind of declare it, the worldly systems and things and powers that be. But then we're longing to make our way home, which is straight ahead of me right now. But yet also there's this temptation to live life uh, in on the golf course in leisure. And yet, as Christ followers, that is not what we're called to do. But rather we're called as we live this life in the wilderness to strive towards biblical faithfulness, to move in the direction of Christ, which is eternity, but also is homeward. And so this morning, as we examine these final words in this chapter of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I would like to examine it with that thought in mind, meanwhile. Because I believe that is what Paul is exhorting you and I, if you are a Christ follower. And if you're not, then hold on, because my prayer for you as you hearken to this message is that you will become a Christ follower. But until that happens, and as you're interrogating Christianity, I want to exhort those of us who are Christ followers to really uh, take heed to what Paul is exhorting us to do uh, in the meanwhile. And I believe that is the thrust and theme of chapter number five of First Thessalonians. Paul shares these words to encourage Christ's followers how to live in the meanwhile. Let me pray and we're going to delve into God's word. Father, I thank you for the hearer. 
I thank you for the listener. But God, I pray even now that we will be doers. We will apply the very word you've called us to. And Father, I pray you'll take this word and it'll transform our life for your glory. So take it and use it to uh, edify your body, to build your people up. In the powerful name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Meanwhile, to the text, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. It says, Now, as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, when destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brother, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do they do their sleeping at night and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of breastplate of faith and love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. The verse, first 12 verses of this chapter, I want to point out the first point I'd have us to take note that we see about how we are to live in the meanwhile that Paul gives us is first that God desires for glorification to lead to each other's edification. God's desire, he desires for glorification to lead to others' edification. We looked at it on last week. We looked at this whole idea of glorification. It is when Christ comes back and we, he, he receives his bride, his church, those who are dead, but also those who are alive. They'll be caught up in the air to meet Christ and we would have these new glorified, resurrected bodies. That is the longing. That is the hope. That is the trust and confidence of every Christ follower. That one day we will encounter this day of glorification where we will meet him and we will be like him. But Paul, he exhorts us saying, look, while this is happening, I don't want you to get so fixated on the times and epochs, on what's happening in the moment, in the earth realm. But rather, I want this to be a reminder to you on that one that we know Christ is coming. And I want it to infect um, and effect how you live. And I think that is the big idea that this whole idea of glorification, it should pull us towards seeking ways to edify and build one another up. There's a couple ideas Paul gives us in those first 12 verses I want to give you that break down this whole idea of how we're to live until that day of glorification. The first is there's a perpetual uh, speediness, perpetual speediness. Paul says in the first four verses, he gives this whole idea of, of someone living not knowing when that great moment is going to come. And he gives this illustrative teaching, if you will. He says, look, just like a thief, no one knows when a thief is going to come. You can't be prepared for a true thief, but you should be prepared for a thief. He says, look, you don't know when he's coming, but you need to be ready in case he comes. He says also he used the illustration of a woman giving birth to a child. Yes, for the mothers, you know, especially for those who you have been given this projected day of when your baby would be due. But yet a week came or two weeks came and that baby was still in the womb and how frustrated you were. He says, much like a woman can't exactly predict when the baby is going to come. She only knows when the pain kicks in, the, the labor pains. He says, so it is for the Christ followers. We should live in perpetual readiness. If I was to use my brother Tim, how he would always say, we, we stay ready so we don't have to get ready. <laughs> he says, look, I want you to stay ready. Live each day as if he was coming that day. He says, live today like he's coming today, not even tomorrow, but like he's coming today. We live in a state of perpetual speediness. We're ready and longing and watching for his return. Paul says, I want to exhort you towards perpetual speediness. Um, many of you all know, for those who know me, track and field is my sport of choice. And I've had the privilege of working with perhaps hundreds of athletes through the ages, through the years. And one of the cool things that's happened in my coaching experience is I always tell the athletes, look, it's the off season that really gets you ready for the season. 
You see, it's what you do in the off season that's really going to prepare you for to stand on that podium when the season comes. And so throughout the off season, we engage in various time trials, which oftentimes the athletes hate. But what, the reason we're doing those time trials is to make certain they stay ready. Paul says, Christ followers, you're not just getting any old medal that one day is going to uh, end up on a shelf that you can't even remember what it was for. But you need to live in a readiness for eternity. He says there's a perpetual speediness that is, is endued in the life of a believer. But then he goes on in verses five through eight to say there's also personal soberness, personal soberness. He goes on in verse five through eight. He says, for you all are sons of light and sons of day. day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Paul says, look, live in such a way that man, you are you are sober. You are you have your mind ready to receive and also obey. He says, don't live as children of darkness, but live as children of the light. He says, live sober minded. Sober minded, that's the whole idea of your mind. It is in tune with the things of God. It is ready to hearken and obey to what God is asking of you in the moment. Soberness. He says, hey, I want you to live in this idea of personal soberness and even his whole idea, what we talk, which we talked about on last week, this idea of holiness and being uh, sanctified, following the Lord, being ready to obey. He says, be alert. That word alert, it means to stay awake as if I'm always watching for opportunities. I'm always ready to be used. Brothers and sisters, I want to exhort you in the midst of this COVID-19 culture. I want to exhort you as Paul would to say, hey, stay ready. Be ready to be used by the Lord. Keep your mind fixed on what God he wants to do through you today. And if through his kindness, he allows tomorrow to come then be ready tomorrow also. Paul says, look, I want you to be sober minded. But then also what we see in verses nine through 10 is he says, also recognize the priceless savior, the priceless savior. He goes on and I love that word, that verse, verses nine and 10. You should underscore that in your Bible, highlight that in your app, because those are such beautiful words for Christ followers. He says, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Paul says, look, I want you to understand the mantle and the impact of your salvation. This salvation, it impacts your future. He's, look what he says. He says, look, for God did not destine us for wrath. He says, look, Christ in his death, he went ahead of you and prepared to hold back God's wrath upon you. Future. He says, but not only does it impact your future, but it also impacts your present. He says he goes on to say in verse nine, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That word obtaining is present tense. It's currently active. It's constantly daily being applied to your life and my life in Christ. But then he goes on for that person who struggles with mistakes of the past. He says, look, but also look at Jesus. He did this before you got here. Matter of fact, the Bible says he's the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He says he goes on to say, verse 10, who died for us. So that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with them. He says, look, even for those who aren't capable of keeping themselves, Christ is sufficient to keep you. This particular time when he's talking about being asleep, he's going back and using this as illustrative talk, talking about those who are sober minded, those who are alert, those who are ready to obey. He's saying, but for even those who are struggling to practice out following Christ faithfully, he says he knew that was going to happen. So with you in mind, he went ahead and covered your past. <laughs> See, salvation, what makes it so beautiful is because it impacts our future, present and our past. He says, don't you understand how priceless your savior is? And then he reminds us in verse 11, he says, therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are also doing. 
language he uses in that one another is not necessarily what I'm doing right now preaching to you, but rather it's standing shoulder to shoulder, being able to encourage your brother, looking him or her in the eye saying, hey, God loves you and you can persevere through this. It's a one on one type edification. Paul would have you, he would have the Thessalonians to understand that the beautiful thing about glorification is it's to lead to others edification. But then he goes on and lays out in verses 12 through 22, this next idea. This next idea is this. God uses cricket sticks to give straight licks. God uses cricket sticks sticks to give straight licks. I love that. Now, I didn't coin that. I believe that's by our, our, our beloved brother um, uh, H Henderson, I believe. Um, but he goes on, Hendricks, I'm sorry, Hendricks, he, he uses that statement. It's a great reminder for the believer. It's that God uses us, though we are crooked, though we are flawed, though we are broken vessels, but yet in his sovereign act of grace, he uses us to do something profound in our life, but also in the lives of others. He goes on and he begins to make this very practical giving, laying out Christian conduct, how we as Christ followers are to live in pursuit of Christ. He goes on. The first part, he deals with the leaders. He deals with the leaders in verses 12 through 13. He says, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charged over you in the Lord and give you instruction." And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. But Paul says, look, I want now to help you understand how you are to relate to your leaders. This is a word to the leaders and the followers. He says, for those, those who are in leadership, those who are, who are following, he says, first, I want you to understand how much you should celebrate and appreciate your spiritual leaders. We live in a day where leadership is always under attack. And I understand, I get it, because sometimes we as leaders, man, you see the kinks in our arm and armor too well. And Paul would say, look, I want to exhort you towards those who are leading. And you see that, they're, man, they're not perfect, but they're leading. They're striving towards biblical faithfulness, towards Christ likeness. And you can't help but see that. I want you to love and serve under them well. Do it with joy. But then also there's a caution and a challenge to us as leaders. Paul says, look, understand the task is, or are you leading well? Can people look at your life and say, you know what? If I follow him, I know the end result is going to be I'm going to look more like Jesus. If I'm following her, I know the, the end product is I am going to look like Christ in following them. Paul would say other in scripture, other places in scripture, follow me as I follow Christ. That is the task and charge to every leader. James would put it this way in James chapter three, verse one. He says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such, we will incur a stricter judgment. In essence, what Paul would hearken the leaders, the caution to us is, look, are you living in such a way that you're working in such a way that people people can look at you and say, look, he is striving. She is striving hard to follow and model and pursue Jesus. The first challenge, the first warning, the first or exhortation is a charge to the leader and the follower. But then he goes on in verses 14 through 15, and we see this challenge to the weak and the strong, the weak and the strong. Verse 14 and 15, he goes on to say, to say, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. People. But Paul says, look, I want to just go ahead and let you know that there are going to be some who are weak among you, but there are also going to be some that are strong. He says, wherever you fall on the end of the spectrum or in between, know that God has you covered. That Jesus has you on, on his mind, that this is good in the fact that God is using these cricket sticks to give some straight licks to keep you on the path towards sanctification and building up and Christ likeness being formed in you. You see how we handle conflict and difficult people is a direct correlation of our strength or weakness. You see, strength is found in our ability to trust the Lord during times we much rather retaliate. 
in essence, is what Paul is declaring. He says, look, I want to exhort you to know that these cricket, cricket sticks, man, God is still using them to give some straight licks. These broken cisterns, these earthen vessels, he is still using to grow you and mature you. We see examples of those who are strong and weak. We see the leader and follower. But then also we see the optimist and the pessimist. The optimist and the pessimist. We see that in verses 16 through 18. He says, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That word all means all. <laughs> Not deep, just very clear. Paul keeps it very simple. He says, look, I want you to constantly be rejoicing, even when you find it difficult and hard. He says, Paul warns us to obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit. He, he, he instructs us, you know, to give thanks to God, even not necessarily for evil events, but to thank God, even in evil times and circumstances. Yet our hope should remain that God continues to work in and through our lives. He says, for the pessimist or the optimist, wherever you find yourself or anywhere in between. He says, know that these words are to encourage you. Keep rejoicing. He says, keep celebrating and looking for something to give God thanks for. He says, pray without ceasing. How do you pray without ceasing? In essence, it's the mind of you being in a posture of surrendering, saying, God, what do you want me to do? What good can you bring out of this? And God, how would you have me to respond in the midst of this? Prayer is not always audible, but it's more so where our minds are going in the moment. He says, look, I want you to pray without ceasing. In this time, I'd hope that if nothing has not grown in your life, I pray and trust. And I, be I bet your prayer life has. In the midst of this, this COVID-19 culture, I'm confident that if you are Christ follower, you have started praying a lot more today than you ever have in the past, perhaps. And that is glorious news. Because Christ is working in you to even perfect and grow you in your prayer life. Paul says, I want you to pray without ceasing. Keep on rejoicing. He says, but in everything gives thanks. Paul, how in the world could we do this? We can give thanks back to that pre previous verse that he gives us in verse 9 and 10. Why? Because the wrath of God has been satisfied. That is the greatest news ever. The wrath of God has been satisfied because of Christ Jesus. Paul says, look, God uses cricket sticks to give straight licks. We see that God, in his beautiful work, he desires for glorification to lead each, to each other's edification. But then the last thing we see in verses 23 through 28 as he moves into this prayer is that God keeps his word and his word keeps us. God keeps his word and his word keeps us keeps us. Verses 23 through 28, he goes into this prayer that he prays for these believers, but also, in essence, praying for us. He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you and he also will bring it to pass, brethren. Pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Paul, in coming Pauline fashion, he closes this out with a prayer for those believers then, but also I believe can be applied to us today. He says, I pray that you will understand that God, his word, it will keep you. And God, through his word, he's going to keep it. There's this, this retroactive, this proactive force intervening on our behalf that God is going to keep his word and through his sovereign power and strength, his word is going to keep you. That is good news because that means that I don't have to keep myself, but I can rely on a God who is able to keep me. Jude will put it this way, now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his matchless glory. To the only wise God, dominion and power. See, that is a God who is able to keep Paul in similar fashion. He says, look, he is going to present you without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. How in the world could he do that? Because God is a God who's able to keep his word. 
He is a God and a ruler who is able to fulfill his promises. All of them are yes and amen. Paul would say in Philippians chapter one, he would say, say, he who begun a good work in you shall see it to completion. That is not a hope. That is an assured promise. You see, God keeps his word and his word keeps us. This letter, First Thessalonians, it is written to people that are living during very difficult times. They're losing their possessions. They're losing their freedoms. They're losing their lives. And Paul, he writes this letter to this young church, reminding them that God is able to keep them, but yet pointing them to that great day of glorification where Christ will return and set all things right. But in the meanwhile, he exhorts them towards faithfulness. This faithful endurance, this faithful trust and waiting for Christ's return. And the same exhortation he gave then, it so applies even now. In the midst of perhaps what you are losing, my friend. In the midst of perhaps the hardship you are facing, the suffering that you're enduring. I want to exhort you as Paul has done through these words in scripture that have encouraged many men and women through the ages. I want to encourage you. With this big idea we gave you in the beginning of this series, that you and I, we learn to treasure Christ, especially when things aren't right. There is something so precious that you and I discover about Jesus in those moments of difficulty, in those moments of unfavorable circumstances that we can only relish and only appreciate when the fire is turned on in life. And so perhaps the most beautiful thing that God is doing in you and through you and around you is that your faith is being matured in Christ. Your trust and your allegiance and your assurance and your confidence that he is a confident hope is being steadied and grounded because of the crisis you're presently facing. And maybe you're listening right here, right now, as I started off saying, and you've yet to surrender your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I wanna exhort you to yield today, to wave up the white flag saying, Lord, I surrender. I surrender it all to you, Lord Jesus, all to you. I give and I surrender. You see, for the Christian, surrender is not a sign of defeat, but it's actually a tremendous sign of victory. And so if you've yet to invite Jesus Christ into your life to reign and rule as Lord and Savior, what do I mean by that? Simply this, Savior meaning that you cannot save yourself. That it's going to take someone who has fulfilled the standard of God perfectly to save you. No matter how small of sin you've committed, one small sin, it disqualifies you from the presence of God. But because of Jesus who fulfilled the perfect standard of God completely and perfectly, man, you now have a savior that wants to present you faultless before this holy God. Lord simply means this, that you are no longer the author and ruler of your life. You are surrendering to someone who is greater, who knows what is best for you and will bring the best out of you. And see, Jesus, he wants to be your Lord and Savior. So my friend, if you've never come to that point of place, I want to encourage you today to invite Jesus Christ to reign and rule over your life as Lord and Savior. Let me pray with you. So Father, I do pray even now for the person who's listening to this message. I pray that you would draw them unto yourself if they don't have a relationship with you, that they might know you. That God, they will see Jesus not as the enemy, but as their elder brother, their loving Savior, their kind and gentle, gentle conquering King. And Father, they will be wooed over to surrender and trusting you. And Father, for those of us who are in Christ, I pray for just uh, a confident hope in the midst of whatever we're losing. Father, I thank you that the truth is we still have so much more to gain. That we're learning how to treasure Christ more than anything this world could offer us. And so, Father, may that lead us towards biblical faithfulness, towards following you with just this reckless abandonment, knowing that you love us and you are for us no matter what happens to us. Well, we love you and we praise you. It's in the mighty name of Christ we pray. Amen. Thanks again for tuning in. And I pray that you are now be encouraged by uh, these words that our worship team is going to lead us through as we sing together. Thanks again for tuning in. God bless you. The only thing I want tonight is to
say thanks again for tuning in to this broadcast and I pray that you were encouraged by God's word. I pray that you were encouraged by the word being sang but also the word being preached and I pray that you will be that good soil that Jesus talks about in his parable of the soils. You will be that soil that produces a harvest a hundredfold even. 
And so I pray that these words we've been studying over these last couple of weeks, they will lead you towards a greater endurance, but also biblical faithfulness as God calls you and invites you on this journey to be used by him to let him know, uh, let the world know that he loves them. And so again, thanks for tuning in. Again, Midtown Bridge Church, thank you for being such a faithful and generous church. Uh, because of your generosity, we are just able to be such a blessing uh, to so many other ministries, but also even members of this church uh, who may have pressing needs. So please continue to be faithful with your tithes and offering uh, because every time you give, know this, I am confident in this, you cannot outgive God. And so every time you give towards his kingdom endeavors, know that God will bless you in the way he deems appropriate. So thank you for being such a faithful church. I want to continue to invite you towards uh, later on today, immediately following this, uh, this, this, this broadcast, we're going to be moving into our member meeting. If you are a member of this church, join us via Zoom uh, in that member meeting. We want to share some updates on ways God has been working in this body, even some of the adjustments we're making as a result of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and how we see ourselves marching forward. So again, thanks so much for being so faithful. Uh, please, if you've yet to connect with the community group, please uh, go to our website. We have groups meeting via Zoom throughout the week, uh, groups on Tuesdays and Wednesday nights. We'd love for you to connect with one of those groups. You can go to www.themidtownbridge.com and find a group meeting on a particular night that suits you best. And you can, you can join from the comfort of your own home. How easy is that? Um, so please join us via community groups meeting throughout the week. And I'm confident you're going to be encouraged. Um, it's a great way for you to be encouraged, but also to encourage one another. God bless you. Thanks again for tuning in. And hopefully, Lord willing, we'll see you at 10 o'clock on next Sunday. God bless you. Oh,